Hey, it's good to be with you, whether you're here in person, whether you're online. I hope you are off to a great weekend. Uh, Our weekend yesterday started very early in the morning. Paulina got up at about quarter to six and she packed her hiking pack and she flew out to Tasmania for a hike. And so you uh, you can pray for her safety. I think she can handle herself. It's more the kids I'm worried about this week as uh, I have to look after them. So think of us. Um, somebody did say to me yesterday, they noticed I, I wasn't wearing socks when I came to church. And they're like, man, Paulina hasn't even been gone a day and he's forgotten how to dress himself. But it's not true. It's not true. All the young adults are doing it this way. They tell me, I, I observe, and I'm doing everything I can to hoodwink you into thinking I'm still part of the younger half of the living population. I'm not doing a very good job, but nonetheless, uh, there we are. And, it, and it's kind of not lost on me that when I was a young boy, uh, my mum dressed me. When I was a young married man, my wife dressed me. You know you're getting old when your kids dress you, right? <laughs> <coughs> But praise God that we're here. Um, Actually, we have four kids. And uh, one of them said to me a few years ago, Dad, why before you get up to preach, does someone pray or you pray? I thought I'd keep it simple. I just said, well, uh, we we ask God to help me do a good job. And he didn't even miss a beat. He said, well, why doesn't it work? (laughs) So I I do want to do a good job today. But how about we pray because I think we need all the help. I can get. Lord, it's a privilege to open your word. And as we do, I pray that you open our hearts. I pray that spiritually you open our eyes and our ears, that we might hear what it is you want to say to us today, Lord. We we want to become more like you. And so we, we really do ask that you would use your truth in Scripture, impart it into us, make it relevant to our circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, I am sure... You have been observing some of the same things I'm watching and experiencing in our church in the last few months. There's been a lot going on, some good things. If you think about the, uh, the Spirit Life series that we've been uh, experiencing, there's, there's kind of like a freshness, would you agree? That, like there's, there's, a, there's an awakening really happening in our spirits toward the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's been a lot of prophetic ministry in our church to us collectively, but also to hundreds of you individually. I think if, if, if I've been listening carefully, we have been challenged a lot more to step into prayer and to be believing and to be expecting for more of God. Are you sensing this? It's like a little wave building on the horizon. There's a little pulse in the ocean. I described it to somebody as like there's the sound of some distant thunder. It's like the promise of a drenching rain that's on its way. And I'm getting excited about this. And I think it's not just our church. If you're talking to people in other churches in Melbourne and around the country, I think God's up to something. He's doing something. And this is this is a you know, this is exciting for us to contemplate. And as I think about that, and even in preparing this message, a little bit of a heaviness came over me for the reason that there's a real risk that not all of us are going to experience everything that God intends in our life in this season if we don't submit ourselves, if we don't make ourselves vulnerable to the new and the different things that he has on his heart for us. And so I want to talk about this today because whilst the enemy might want to come against us and diminish some of God's move in our life, I think sometimes we can be our own worst enemies, that, that we make decisions that put distance between us and God. And I put myself in this category. And one of the things that often I think creates the greatest amount of distance between us and all that God is wanting to do in and through us is a sense that over the years, he may have let you down. I'm not sure if that's your experience. It's certainly mine. I've spoken to a lot of people about this. It's like he hasn't come through on something that you expected, 
that you have prayed about. And little by little, as time passes, you have lost some confidence in who he is and what he's capable of. And without necessarily even it being a conscious thing, parts of your heart, parts of your spirit tend to shut down. They're not as open. They're not as vulnerable. And when we see the Holy Spirit starting to move in our church and in our lives, we, can, we are at risk of not fully experiencing what he intends because we haven't exposed ourselves to him like we once may have done. I believe that God has put dreams into some of your hearts. I believe that he's made promises over your life. And as the years have passed and those things remain unfulfilled, it's like you've lost confidence in who your God is. He's getting progressively smaller in your world because you can't believe him for more when he hasn't already done some of the things you expected would have come to pass by now. Does this make sense, church? There can be a a sense of unfulfilled dreams that, that, that discredit who you think your Father in heaven is. And church, you know, with Are You OK Week, that dialogue happening all over the country, Let's not pretend that unmet or unfulfilled expectations or loss of hope or forgotten dreams, they are a massive trigger for for mental distress. But church, it affects us emotionally. It affects us spiritually. And what we want to hold a posture on is total abandonment, really, to what God wants to do in our lives and through us. And we don't want any of this distance that sometimes we create between us and God. I I really like the Top Gun quote. Uh, Tom Cruise's character did his buzz of the air tower and his superior was dressing him down and said, your ego is writing checks your body can't cash. But church, every check God writes, he can cash. I'm here to tell you this morning, I don't have a five-point message. I really just have a simple but profound biblical truth. God is good. He can fulfil every promissory note that He writes, every dream He has planted in your heart, every promise He has spoken over your life, every prophetic word that He has invested into you, He is good for it. We can be confident in our God. And the only thing we have to deal with are our unexpected time frames and the unplanned delays between where we are now and the future that he has promised. Church, I really want to show you this beautiful scripture in Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. Without any context, let me just read you this simple but incredibly encouraging sentence. The scripture says this, not one, of all of the Lord's good promises to the Israel failed. Not one. Every one of them was fulfilled. Church, that's a powerful sentence in our, in our scripture. Not one of the promises that God made to Israel was left unfulfilled. But you probably know the story. It's a familiar part of our Sunday school lessons, uh, you know, Abraham got given a promise that he would be the father of a great nation, that he would inherit Canaan, which actually we know to be called the promised land. But there was a little bit of a um, a journey to seeing that promise come to pass, wasn't there? Uh, Firstly, God had to speak not just to Abraham, he had to speak to Isaac and Jacob. He had to reinforce the promise to Joseph. Joseph had an interesting dream. He dreamt that God would make him a leader and bring him into authority, but he had to get beaten by his brothers, thrown in a pit, uh, sold into slavery, put into prison before he saw any of some of God's promises come to pass. Moses then comes on the scene and he gets called out of the desert to help rescue the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. They need a miraculous crossing of the Red Sea before they too do a 40-year lap of the desert, 
totally dependent on God for food from heaven, quail and manna. Then they need another miraculous water crossing through the Jordan before they get to the threshold of the promised land. Joshua is now in charge only to be facing what? The impenetrable walls of Jericho. And they have to march around that before they see a victory over the enemy and start to possess the beginnings of the promise. But the Scripture says that God fulfilled every word He spoke over the house of Israel. Not one promise was left unfulfilled. But I think you would agree in that little storyline, there are a few unexpected time frames, church. There are a few unplanned delays. And I want to encourage you that there are no forgotten dreams in God. Church, I'm preaching to you. I'm speaking this over and into your life. There are no forgotten dreams in God. There are no broken promises in your life. There are just these unexpected time frames and unplanned delays that you and I have to contend with. Between there and where we're going, between here and there, what, it's, it's the ugly middle. We call it in, in our family, we call it the ugly middle as we are waiting to see how God is going to bring about the fulfilment of all of His promises. Uh, if, if we haven't met, I'm just going to tell you now, I'm an impatient person. If you live with me, if you've ever worked with me, you would know this to be true. Of course, uh, I can dress it up more virtuously. I can say I'm very goal orientated, that I just value productivity, right? That I don't want to be found idle or lazy. I want to be an achiever. But, you know, my wife realises you would know it if you spent any time with me. I'm just impatient. That's the bottom line. Uh, I hate standing in queues. In fact, a very extreme example, a couple of months ago, I queued up at the passport office at three o'clock in the morning. Beanie, camp chair. I waited eight hours only to be told that they can't help me and to come back in a week's time. That just destroys a man's spirit, let me tell you. Uh, I hate traffic, of course, we, um, you know, we, we, we love patience in the drivers behind us. It's the drivers in front of us that we scorn. Um, I, I, I can't stand being on hold on the phone. That's mild water torture. I, I, I travel on planes a couple of times a week and if I get a flight delay, I, I'm not good. You don't want to be sitting next to me. I mean, I'm impatient. I mean, I'm the guy who will try and do two minute noodles in 90, minutes, uh, 90 seconds and just put up with the crunch, right? Like... <laughs> I'm impatient. I like Margaret Thatcher's comment though. She said she's extraordinarily patient as long as she gets what she wants when she wants it. Yeah? Um, and if you've ever heard of any of Will Ferrell, the comedian's uh, comments, I think he'd make a great premarital counsellor. His recommendation is before you get married, sit your fiancé in front of a computer with a slow internet speed and see who they really are. I'm not sure I would have passed that test if Paulina had run me through that gauntlet. But church, uh, knowing this little dark side of my personality, my impatience, could you imagine how I respond before the Lord when I get all of my prophecies out over the last 30 years and I read through them and I, I contemplate what God has promised over my life and I look at it and I think, well, what is he doing? Why hasn't it come to pass already? Like, like I get anxious, I get impatient. I feel like, God, you, you should be there already. But church, for some of you, it's, it's not just impatience. Actually, it's, it's, it's despair. It's, it's like a deep-seated pain. I don't, I don't want to trivialise this. There, there's heartache. There have been... Promises over your life, breakthroughs that you have been praying for and expecting. And as the months have ticked by and the years have passed, it, it has created an incredible amount of disappointment in your life. And you 
lose confidence in what your God said and who he is. And maybe even unknowingly, you have created some distance between you and him in that you're not prepared to trust him like you once did. Your God is getting smaller. And church, I just want to encourage you. There's no forgotten dreams in God. We just have to work with time frames. I, um, I, I often think as I pray and as I kind of meditate on the promises in my life, I, I kind of think it's like a big digital clock on the wall of my life. This is not my preaching timer, just in case you're worried. <laughs> they're, not, they're not concerned I'm going to go that much over time that they've put it right there for you to hold me to account. This is the digital clock in our life. And every time I pray over a promise or I feel God's given me a dream or he's put a seed into my heart to do or be somebody, it's like I put God on the clock and I frame in my expectations of when and how God's going to come through. And there's like a deadline that I've set that I think is reasonable that he's going to somehow oblige And with every year that that clock keeps ticking over, that he hasn't come through, it's another blow to my faith. It's another blow to my confidence. And church, whether you're here, whether you're at home and you're listening to this message, I hope it's speaking to you. I wonder what some of those unfulfilled dreams are, those seemingly broken promises in your life are this morning that might hold you back from stepping into all of what God is doing in our church in this season and in your life. I wonder whether you lie in bed at night and you almost lament the clock. You know, in your mind's eye, you're looking at it and you're thinking, God, it should have been done already. Didn't I hear you clearly? Are you not good for it? Aren't you going to cash the check? And it inhibits you going back to the well to believe for more, to hear freshly. You know, I was 10 years old when I made a decision to follow Christ. And a lot of times when people hear that, they think, oh, that must have just been a nominal childhood, boyish decision who grew up in a family who already loved God. That's not true. At 10 years of age, I had this very personal, very dramatic experience with God. I got filled with the Spirit and immediately was consumed with this idea of wanting to serve his purposes. And um, around that time, on a Saturday morning, my routine was that I would get up before the family and I'd watch the cartoon connection. I'd sit in my beanbag. This is the early 1980s. And if any of you remember the World Vision ads that would play at that time, These were, up until that point, at least for me, unseen images of young Ethiopian kids, like distended bellies, really frail limbs, flies buzzing around their eyes, clearly malnourished. You'd you'd watch a few try and stand up and stagger around before they collapse in a cloud of dust into the dirt. And, And I'm sitting there watching these images on TV, nobody to care for them. And I just felt the heart of God, the compassion he had for the poor and the needy. And I felt like he put a seed in my heart. He he planted a dream that he was going to use me to work amongst some of the poorest of the poor. And as a little 10-year-old, I made a pledge, God, I'm up for that. And I nurtured that dream all the way through my teenage and schooling years. And was convinced that God was going to make me a doctor or a physio or a nurse. And I was going to be a medical missionary. I was going to live cross-culturally, learn an unknown dialect. I met Paulina. She went on to become an intensive care nurse. She too felt like the pangs of God's compassion for these people. She wanted to serve that, that space of international poverty. Like I would be... Not going too far if I said this, this was a big part of our identity as we went into young adulthood and married life. We were expecting this dream to be fulfilled imminently. I had God on the clock, on my digital clock. And we got married. 
we, uh, we did some short-term missions trips. We went overseas. We, we looked for the open doors, the green lights. You know, apparently, the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. And we're like, God, this is going to happen. And then it didn't. We, we didn't have any opportunities. So we took jobs at Royal Melbourne Hospital as a holdover strategy. I then, as a bit of a hobby business, started treating a few patients in the carport at home, just in Scoresby here, starting a small physio practice. And it was all waiting for God's promise to come through. And the years have kept ticking over. And with every new practice we launched and the business became clearly part of God's then plan for our life and we just accepted that and obeyed, I'm going to be honest, a big part of me grieved the promise that I thought God had put in my heart. I thought it was now a long gone, evaporated dream. And when I would watch friends and others take up assignments to go overseas into the mission field, it was hard. There were days I found that really hard. I felt like God had passed me over, that he had found somebody else more capable, that maybe I couldn't trust him. And if I was to even dare open my heart for new or more or different, it was a risk that I couldn't be vulnerable around. But church, I want to tell you, I've learnt in the years that have followed that there are no forgotten dreams in the God we serve. There aren't any broken promises. I just had distorted timeframes. My clock wasn't calibrated to who he was and what he was doing. Don't, Don't be confused. I feel like the work God gave us to do in the marketplace and business was meaningful and part of his plan. It just wasn't part of mine. And remember, God is eternal. He created time. This is an arbitrary construct. Finite limits we put around his supernatural promises. And I've come to expect that he will deliver in his perfect timing. Church, I I don't know, is is this something you struggle with at home and online? Is is there dreams, are there promises, are there things that you feel have now created some distance between you and God? Well, when we look to Scripture, we can find lots of examples of this. And who better than the power couple of faith, Abram and Sarai, right back at the beginning of the story of what has become our gospel, Abram and Sarah, before they were even name changed to Abraham and Sarah, these two knew what it meant to wrestle with an unfulfilled promise. Let's pick up their story in Genesis 12, verse 1. It says that the Lord came to Abraham and declared, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land that I'm going to show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. I mean, if we're talking about promises this morning, City Life, that's got to be the promise of all promises. I mean, could you imagine Abram and Sarai lying in the tent at night the day after he received this incredible dream, this, this, this promise of God. It's like they would have put their digital clock up on the tent wall and they must have imagined, how's it going to happen? You know, how do we become a nation? When will it occur? You know, all the specifics, all the details, the logistics of this. And they would be imagining and forming a view in their heart about all of the timeline and the stages and milestones of how a promise like that is going to be fulfilled. We know theologically this is the precursor to the Abrahamic covenant. And, uh, you know, Abraham is credited in Hebrews as being our father of faith because he believed this promise that God said over his life. 
But then the clock kept ticking and not much seemed to happen. His circumstances didn't really change. And some months passed and some years and we pick up in Genesis 15 this dialogue between God and Abraham. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And he says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who's going to inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram said, you've given me no children and my servant is going to become the heir. Then the word of the Lord came and said, this man is not going to be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood. And he took Abram outside and said, look up at the sky, count the stars if you can. So many shall be your offspring. So when Abram had the doubts that this promise was being left unattended too long, God reinforces the dream. He reinforces his commitment to him. Church, even Abram doubted. And, and we have doubts about whether God is going to come through. And we need to be reassured from time to time that he will, that he is, that his unseen hand is at work behind the curtain of our life that we aren't necessarily aware of what's happening in the spiritual realms, but we don't want to create that distance between us and him in the waiting. In Genesis 16, Abram and Sarah had waited 10 years now for the promise to come good. 10 years, a decade. I don't know how long you've been waiting, but 10 years is a long time. And they clearly had lost their confidence in how big their God was. We pick up in verse 1, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she did have an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children, so go sleep with my slave and perhaps we can have a family with her. And Abram agreed. Sure, you are familiar with aspects of this story. They took matters into their own hands. And, you know, it's clear, Ishmael, the son who would come from that inappropriate strategy that they deployed, was not the promised heir. In fact, he went on to become the father of 12 Arab nations, which we will soon learn kind of mirrors the 12 tribes of Israel. And from then to today, you don't need me to tell you, there has been enmity between the Arabs and the Jews ever since because Ishmael wasn't the promise. But the clock said God was late. And so Abram and Sarah did what was in their heart and they helped God out, but it didn't go well. And church, I don't know, have you tried to help God out ever when you feel like he's running over on your expectations of how this dream or this promise should come to pass? I'm ashamed to say I do. I do this often because I'm impatient. In, in our business, still nurturing this dream to be involved in the mission work that I felt God had planted in my heart as a young boy. I mean, we had started a foundation, we had visited projects, we were writing checks, but none of it came close to fulfilling really what was in my heart. So I thought I'd help God out. 15 years into our journey, we had been waiting, waiting, waiting. And I thought, the clock's going to blow up if I wait any longer. And so I staged a coup inside my own business. I employed a CEO to take over my role to release me into some more time and opportunities. And initially it looked very responsible, very staged, very moderate. I got Paulina's support and the board around me. 
then something shifted in me and I didn't even feel it happening at the time, but it was my impatience and my eagerness and I accelerated this transition faster than it should ever have gone. And it's nobody's fault but my own, but I set this guy up for failure. I overwhelmed him with the responsibilities. Team members around him who kind of, uh, they, they suffered under the different leadership style and they had loyal people who had been with me for 10 and more years left the business. Like it was an unmitigated disaster. It was my Ishmael. And worst of all, I robbed myself of the miracle that God was planning behind the scenes that I wouldn't come to realise for at least five more years. But it's because I thought he wasn't going to come through on the promise. So I had to humble myself. I had to go back into the business. I had to work harder than ever before to fix all the mess and regain the momentum. And it was a great lesson for me. But City Life, I wonder how you respond when you think your dreams have been forgotten. Do, 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 you get, do you get sad about that? Does it break your heart? Do you grieve? So, some of you might get angry, angry at God. It might diminish your faith, your, your, your willingness to believe again for some of the things that God is speaking to you now and to us as a church. You might stop asking for things because he hasn't filled the list that's already there. You might become jealous of those around you. You might, you might stop dreaming. Like me, like Abram, you might take some matters into your own hand and try and illegitimately accelerate what you thought God should have and already done. There's a little boy in school who was playing up and his teacher came to him and said, do you remember what you promised me? He said, yes, yes, ma'am, I promised to behave. She said, do you remember what I promised you? He said, yes, ma'am, you promised you'd send me to the principal's office if I didn't. But ma'am, given I broke my promise, I'm happy for you to break yours. <laughs> but that's not the God we serve. He doesn't break promises. Church, city life, city life, we serve a faithful, faithful father. In Genesis 21, after 25 years of watching the clock, we read in verse one, the Lord was gracious to Sarah. He said, the Lord did everything that he promised. Sarah became pregnant. She bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time that God had promised. Abram gave the name Isaac to the son that Sarah had bore him. Church, God can cash all his checks. There are no broken promises in the purposes of God. You know, for Paulina and me and our story in this business and really the struggle that, that we have had I want to tell you, I want to give glory to God that He is at work. I mean, we are still a work in progress. But even in the last 18 months, I've seen Him bring forward some of the promises that He has put in our heart. In fact, um, in, in, in this most recent period, there has been a series of miracles that have happened inside our business that no man could ever take credit for during really uncertain and difficult times that we've all lived through such that we have now um, merged our business with an ASX-listed parent and I am released from all of my obligations, from day-to-day -day operational responsibilities and we've been given resources to now think about how we might be able to continue to serve Father in different ways. And not all of what we have dreamed and not all of what I believe God has promised is fulfilled yet, but I'm encouraged that he hasn't forgotten. And it's not just 25 years in the waiting for me because it's 36 since I was that young boy and I felt like God framed some of his purposes for my life. But I feel full of encouragement, full of belief. 
I I wanna reduce the gap, the distance that I've put between me and God in my doubts and my wonderings as to whether He is faithful. We don't have a lot of time for me to go through this in detail, but I I have gone through the Scriptures and found the record of truth that attests to God's faithfulness. And if you want the notes, I'll send them to you later. But maybe just close your eyes. Let me speak this over your life. Let me, let me um, j- just declare it to change the spiritual climate of your circumstances. In Deuteronomy 7, it says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is a faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations. Psalm 145, the Lord is faithful to all of His promises towards all that He has made. Jeremiah 1 says, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word will be fulfilled. Ezekiel 12, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, None of my words will be delayed any longer. Whatever I say will be fulfilled. 2 Peter says, The Lord isn't slow to fulfil His promises as we count slowness, but He is patient toward us. Romans 4 says, Be convinced God is able to do what He's promised. Psalm 89, He can't violate His covenant. He will not lie. He won't alter His word that has gone forth from His lips. I could keep going. Numbers 23, God's not a man that He should lie. He's not a son of man that He would change His mind. If He's spoken at church, He's going to fulfil it. God is faithful. He is absolute. He is unfailing. He is unwavering. He is infallible. He is constant. He is loyal. He is inexhaustible. He's changeless and timeless, relentless toward us. Church, and I want to encourage you, whatever dream, whatever promise, Whatever seed has been planted in your life, whatever you are lingering and waiting for a fulfilment and completion around, don't let it create distance between you and God. Don't let it create a hesitation in the way you would approach Him in this new season, I believe, we're stepping into as a church. Get your clock calibrated to the purposes and the time frames and the eternity and the bigness of the God we serve. Don't be discouraged. Practically, I ask myself with a word like this, how are we meant to respond? And again, when I go to Scripture, the word that keeps coming up is to tarry. You don't even know what that word is maybe, to tarry. That's not a very familiar word, but it's a biblical word, so I use it. Hebrews 10 verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He who promised is faithful. And church, to tarry. To tarry means to hold fast, to be unwavering. It's actually to actively wait. It's not a passive idleness. It's to invest in faith. It's actually to prepare for the fulfilment of the Word that has been spoken over your life. It's to speak a language of hope. In fact, the the Word image I see is like a runner poised at the beginning of the race, waiting for the gun to go off, the energy building, the anticipation, lingering with optimism, expectant. Church, this is... This is the biblical advice between the here and the there, in the ugly middle, as we wait on God. David in the Psalms repeatedly talks about tarrying, waiting on the Lord, being prayerful, being thankful. And church, I wanna make sure that you're tarrying for the promises that God's put on your life. Don't be tarrying for your own ideas. Don't be tarrying for selfish ambitions. Be wary that you're not waiting for a train that was never promised to come. 
But if you are tarrying for the dream that God put in you and you believe in all your heart that it's from Him, then our encouragement is to linger with an enthusiastic anticipation, to be prayerful, to be expectant, to wait for His perfect time frame. Some of you are saying, Jace, that's not the word I wanted today. I wanted the word that said the promise was going to be fulfilled this month. That in fact, I should stand with spiritual authority and I should fight in the heavenly realms and I should command the fulfilment of my promise. That I should bind the enemy and expect this to come through right now. And my only caution to that would be, is remember, it wasn't the enemy And it wasn't you who gave the promise, it was God. And you don't wanna run ahead or lag behind His perfect timing. So stand on the spiritual authority you've been given. But between here and there, as you wait for His fulfilment, we tarry with expectation. We tarry with hope. And there's a beautiful message in in Habakkuk 2.3 where the prophet says, And he's talking about the the giving of a prophecy and its eventual revelation. He says this, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and it won't lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. And so church, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I know the worship team are up here and we're going to enter into just a little bit of song as we open our hearts. And I'm praying that this message speaks to you. I'm I'm praying that this isn't just interesting theology or definitely just motivational talk. I I hope that you are feeling something in your spirit as you contemplate what it is that God intends for your life in this season and for the years to come. And that you don't let any distance remain between you and Him. And I actually really feel like there's at least two groups of people who might wanna actively take another step this morning because this message resonates. The first group are those of you who As you listen to my story, as you read Abram's story, you're like, you know what, I've I've had a digital clock. It's expired long ago and I've pulled back from God. In fact, some of you have walked away from God because of seemingly broken promises that you think He's no longer good for. And I want to encourage you. God sees you, He loves you. His Word will be fulfilled. It's just a matter of time. But you want to close that gap this morning. You want to come back to that place of fresh belief to open yourself to those promises. Maybe it's not as dramatic that you've walked away from the Lord, but you know you have shut down some parts of your heart. You're not as vulnerable to Him as you once were. There's some no-go zones. There's some areas that you just can't trust Him in anymore. And and so there's a spectrum in this experience, but I would encourage you, respond to the Lord this morning and open yourself up to His promises again. The second group would be those that as soon as I said the word tarry, you were like, really, Jace? I'm exhausted. I've been believing God. I don't want to give up. I'm still on the trail. I'm trying to live a life of submission and faith and hope. But you want me to tarry more? And I would just say, if you're in that camp, I'm going to invite you to come down the front. We want to stand with you. We want to pray with you. The the leaders and the prayer team will be here to encourage you because the Lord wants to strengthen you. It's not for me to say when your promise comes due. I mean, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It'd be like Oprah to be able to say, look under your seats and there's all of your promises fulfilled. I don't know God's clock for my own life in all areas, let alone all of yours. But church, I want to declare with utter confidence that your dreams aren't forgotten. 
And it's just our unexpected time frames, our unplanned delays. And if you are weary and it's a call to keep tarrying, then come, take a step. Let us stand with you. Let us pray together. And let's believe that God has your plans in hand. Why don't we just sing this worship song together. If you want to come up the front and have some prayer, stand together in this response. I welcome you as we sing. Come on down. Christ alone, Church, let's keep responding. He's the God of promises. He's the God who fulfills His promise.